You're listening to the Faith Breeds Hope podcast, episode number 40. Today, I speak with founder and CEO of Sober Sis, Jennifer Couch, on Sober Minded Living. Welcome to the Faith Breathed Hope podcast, where we gain inspiration and motivation from others who share their touching stories of renewing hope and discovering purpose in any circumstance. I'm your host, Christina Reisinger, and today we will be encouraged by another tremendously inspirational topic that will embolden you to release fear, begin taking small steps forward, and move into your God-given purpose to live and serve in this life. Join me for today's story. Hey, Jen, and welcome to Faith Breathed Hope. How are you today? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. I am so glad to have you. And uh, so, you know, Jen is the founder of Sober Sis, and we are going to talk about um, being sober minded, sober minded living, actually. And the first thing I always have my guests do, Jen, is to tell everybody a little bit about their story. So would you mind starting with that, please? Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you again for having me and just the opportunity. I think this is going to be a great, great conversation. Um, So I'm Jen. I live in Texas. I am a new empty nester. And I like to kind of jokingly say I'm a retired gray area drinker. And most people are like, huh, what's that? That's a lot of words to describe yourself. But that's really kind of where my story with Sober Sis begins is um, I was actually a little bit later in life drinker. I really didn't drink a lot when I was younger. So I was one of those um, young working moms that found myself in networking happy hours And kind of the stresses of life started kind of building after I'd been married and after I'd kept those for a while. That's when I really recognized, oh, wow, this is hard work. And you mean I can have a drink at the end? Oh, wow. Like a prize, like a reward. And so really throughout my 30s is when I really started um, getting in the social drinking scene. Um, With this networking, uh, my husband and I picked it up as almost like a hobby (laughs) to do together with all the wine tours, beer tastings, patios. And it was really towards my late 30s that I started to feel that, man, this this is really becoming like really important in my own life. I'm starting to really look towards wine o'clock as kind of that release from the from the day. I was so mindful by day. So many good intentions. I would wake up and have a great, you know, time in God's word as a believer, just such good intentions for my day, mind, body, and soul, you know, working out, drinking my green juice. I call it, I was in the um, detox, just a retox loop because I would detox by day by doing all these healthy things and then turn around and oftentimes undo it in the evenings by just opening a bottle of wine while I was cooking and then having a little bit more while I was cleaning it, (laughs) cleaning the kitchen up after everyone vacated. And before I knew it, I was just really caught in the trap of drinking most every evening, whether that was with book club, my husband, or by myself. It didn't even matter. It was just something that became a part of my life. And I also recognized really in my young 40s that I was starting to use it as a coping tool to deal with anxiety, um, boredom, and quite honestly, a little bit of my own grief and sadness in areas where I felt helpless, where I felt a little bit out of control. And I, and that made me feel sad. Some of the things I was worried about were really grieving for me. And I didn't know how to handle it because I felt helpless at the time dealing with, with some, some raising teenagers and all that comes with that. And so that's when I started to really recognize, okay, Jen, Time out. You're not physically addicted to alcohol. You can choose to walk away. And that's why I call myself that gray area drinker is because I wasn't physically addicted to the point that I couldn't stop on my own. But mentally, emotionally, I was finding myself leaning on alcohol as just a crutch, a social crutch, 
um, an emotional crutch. And I, I didn't like that because it really isn't who I am. It didn't really line up with who I knew I was and who I wanted to be. So right before I turned 46, I kind of took inventory of my life. My, my teenager was about to graduate high school. And so she was 18. She was about to look at her life and make some changes as she was leaving those teenage years. And I really took it as a cue for me as a mom to look at my own life and begin to really take some inventory and say, Jen, what are you going to do different now, girl? You're, you're at a crossroads. You're kind of at a pivot point. Like, what are you going to do now? Like you're, you're kind of getting your kids older. And, um, and I knew that that was kind of my chance and my opportunity to, to do some things differently. And I knew, I knew intuitively (laughs) the first place for me to start as far as uh, mind, body, and spirit really was to start looking at my relationship with drinking because it was the one thing that just was undermining me. It was holding me back. It was holding me down uh, because the shame, the guilt, the frustration, the regret was adding up and undoing so much of the joy and intention and mindfulness that I had. So that's when I began my journey and long story short, after about almost almost a year of being alcohol free, really as a lifestyle discovery choice, I, I didn't know if I would become alcohol free as a lifestyle, but I really found that I just felt so much better mentally, emotionally, in every way. And so um, that's what I, I did is started Sober Sis to give other women the opportunity to have their own journey of self-discovery and, and really renegotiating their relationship with alcohol without labels, without rules, without shame, without judgment. So I tell people all the time, you know, I'm AKA Sober Sis, but I'm not really a sobriety group. It's not really a sobriety club. It's really more of a group of real women from all over the world getting together and offering each other empathy and space to wrestle out loud in our relationship with alcohol, which is usually kind of a stigmatized um, stereotype misunderstood topic. And so I'm so glad Christina, that that's why you're having part of why you're having me on today is just to be able to bring light to that because it's often not talked about enough. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that I set out to do on Faith Brief Tope and and, in my grief, um, I guess, journey as far as helping other people and serving other people is making sure that um, even though or even as a Christian, you know, that is that is first and foremost, the the area that I I start with. Um, Mm -hmm. However, there are so many hard topics that Christians face and they feel like they can't talk about. And so one of the things that I set out to do is to make sure that we talk about some of the hard things and um, not from a place of shame and, um, you know, but more of a a place of healing and a place of hope um, and a place of forgiveness and and all those those good positive things. And so, um, like you said, so many people drink for so many different reasons. It could be that they're going out and they feel socially awkward. And so it kind of takes the edge off so that they can mingle with other people and they're not nervous and self-conscious. It could be that they get caught up in that thinking that that's something that is expected of them when they go out with uh, friends from work or, you know, starting off in in school or anything around their friends, that kind of peer pressure. Um, And and it can also be a coping mechanism for grief. Uh, A lot of things that happen, which, you know, if, if you talk to people, you know, that alcohol is a depressant. So it, it doesn't really make logical sense, I guess, to use it as a way to cope because it is a depressant. However, um, many, many people use it for things that go wrong where they feel like they have no other way to turn or no other space to turn to. Um, and it does, it, you know, it starts to take that edge off. The problem is, is that it can become addictive and it can become something that you sit in and are comfortable in without having to deal with whatever it is that's going on in your life. You're not actually dealing with those emotions and those, um, the situations, the circumstances that come up, you're just masking it. It's like putting a band aid on something instead of really looking at it and seeing if it needs stitches or antibiotic or something like that. So, um, you know, I, 
<laughs> I like the way that you talk about um, how you, you start off helping these people. You said women, right? Is it women? Yes. yes. So this, hello, it's women. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, and, and it's not from a place of shame or not from a place of judgment, because I feel very much that when we do take that angle of shame and judgment, whether your belief is that you should do something or not, when you take that angle, it does not, it's not well received. It's not um, helping anybody grow from whatever it is that they're doing. Um, in fact, it will make them retreat very quickly and say, Hey, I don't want any of that because you're making me feel like I'm a terrible person. I already feel bad anyways, right. you know, for whatever the reason was in the first place that I started to need this. And then now that I need it, I kind of already know that it's not probably the best thing for me. I'm reaching out for help. And then you're going to point fingers at me and make me feel like it's even worse. So I like that, that you can come alongside somebody and say, you know what, let's see how we can move forward with this and help you not rely on it and help you be able to cope in a different way. And I think that's what we're going to talk about, you know, today is this area of grief. And so many times you see um, people who go through loss, people who have um, one type of uh mental thing going on, um, any kind of diagnosis, they also have a comorbid issue such as uh, an addiction to alcohol or different things like that. Um, and then a lot of times you see people who haven't had a drink at all turn to it because of some life circumstance. So um, have you come across that quite a bit with, with the women that you're meeting? Um, and are they able to be very transparent with you from the beginning? Or is that something that you have to really pull out of them because there's a trust issue going on? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I think what, what is amazing with our group is just the, the power of seeing others be vulnerable creates this atmosphere of connection that really is the antidote to addiction because women get in there. When, when women first come into Sober Sis, we meet on a Zoom call and they, I'm sure, I know, are nervous, hesitant, are these my people? Are they going to get me? Is this like an AA meeting? What is going on? And it's one of my favorite calls that I get to do uh, every month. And it's this runway call and women get on for the very first time to maybe even openly talk about their relationship with drinking. And I start every time by sharing my story. I go first and I, I start out by not saying, well, y'all tell me about you. I start out saying, let me tell you about me. What? And then I tell, you know, five, 10 minutes of my story. And then I just say, what about my journey? Even if it's not the exact circumstances, what about my feelings? What about my uh, experience resonates with you? And I tell you, they just start popcorning in. Oh my gosh, me too. Wow. I cannot believe you just said that. <laughs> and I'm like, no, really the bottle breakdown. It's a real thing. So I think when they, when they start to realize it's safe, people are so hungry to be vulnerable. They're so wanting to be real that once they sniff it, they, it's like they can smell the aroma of safety and I hope the aroma of Christ in our group. And they, they can sense that. And it is like an oasis. It is like walking in and just getting a big drink of water when really your heart is so thirsty. And ironically, pun intended, we're turning towards these other drinks when really our heart's just thirsty for connection, to be seen, to be understood, and to be acknowledged that life is difficult and anyone can fall prey to leaning on a substance, whether that's food, caffeine, sugar, nicotine, alcohol, the list is long. It's so long. And so I think when women are like, oh, wow, I'm really not a bad person. I'm just struggling right now. And this is getting unhealthy in my life. And if I could just talk about that and figure it out, out loud without trying to do it all on my own, all in my own head, I might can find some real freedom. It, it happens ironically pretty quickly. And I think it's because in our group, we cut out the small talk, you know, so often you really have to build so much trust before you would share one of your biggest struggles or secrets. But with our group, it's almost like 
you're entering in through that door of commonality of this is a like-minded struggle. So it kind of cuts through a lot of that fluff and we bond even faster because we're going there first. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's made a big difference. Yeah. And and I see that with, with grief too, you know, when, when you meet someone who has gone through a similar situation, it's just almost like an automatic bond, you know, and I meet another mother who has lost a child. It's just like this, even though it's different, you know, it's happened different. I've had uh, mothers who have experienced miscarriage and stillbirth and even murder and, um, you know, death by suicide and just all kinds of different things. Babies have died. Children have died. Adults uh, have, have died. Um, But there's some kind of this, this bond saying, you know what, we've been through the loss of a child that there's a, this, this almost a secret understanding and it's, it's not a good thing. None of us want to be there, but it's refreshing to know that you don't have to walk this walk alone. And that is why I started this podcast Mm -hmm. because I knew that I can work with certain people. I can work with people on grief. um, But I couldn't share the same exact story as all these other people could. And, you know, while I can tell you about my, um, my story with Isabella and and what all went on with her and her being sick and all that kind of thing. Um, You know, these other things you, my guests can share. And I know there's somebody out there in the audience who's listening and said, okay, well, your situation is not mine. I can't relate. However, the guest that you brought on that person, I relate to that person. I can sit here and say, you know what, maybe I'm not, Um, this oddball who has to stress out and do everything alone. Maybe I can reach out for help and accept help. And so that's one of the very big reasons why um, we do this. So I'm so glad that you're here. I'm so glad that we're talking about this. And I did have a couple of questions. So, um, you know, first of all, it, like we said, it is a Christian podcast and there can be this, not even just with Christianity, with this area of social media, this this time of social media, where everybody presents themselves um, in a certain way. You know, you walk into a church and you're all dressed up and mm-hmm. maybe some things have changed. Different churches, people don't dress up. But for the most part, this the idea of getting dressed up and uh, presenting your best self, mm-hmm. you know, to everybody in the congregation. And, um, you know, it's same thing on social media. You present your best self. Now, there are some people that uh, do what I call word vomit, where they, they just kind of tell you everything that's going on in their life. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the person that comes on and they're struggling so hard behind the scenes, but they're trying so hard to keep up and make sure everybody thinks they have it all put together. And that may be a personality thing that may not be it, but I think it also is conditioned by all the things that we see um, in social media nowadays. So um, for those people, they may feel shamed, you know, in, in talking about this. And I'm guessing that you have found that opening up and being transparent and being vulnerable, like you just said, helps kind of get people in um, more of a comfort area to say, okay, not, not, it's okay for me to do this, but okay. Um, I'm not alone and okay. I can beat this, whatever it is, the struggle in my life, I can beat it. And there is hope. Have you, you've seen that more and more as you keep working with different women? For sure. Uh, And I love what you just said. That was so true about how in social media, in church, in all these places, we just put our best foot forward. It's just that our human nature to want to show everyone our best parts on the outside. And we compare, you know, our inside to someone else's outside. And it's like, oh man, I am really far behind or I'm not where I should be or wow, if they only knew You know, I I often thought that when I was struggling, sitting in the church pew, leading a Bible study, really crying out to the Lord, like, I want to give you everything. I'm not even sure how to give you this (laughs) because I kind of want to keep it too. And um, there were times where I just thought, wow, you know, it's such a divided life I was living that I thought if people really, really knew me, if they really knew the struggle inside, would they still think highly of me? Would they still think I'm a good mom, that I love the Lord, that I'm responsible? Because everything on the outside shows all that. 
-hmm. but on the inside, I don't feel that way. I feel, uh, I feel a mess, felt a mess. Mm -hmm. Well, I can still feel a mess. <laughs> Even sometimes now alcohol free doesn't make the mess go away in my life. It just makes me able to deal with mess and hardship and struggle and strain and all the realities of life. If anything has kept me more in reality, it didn't take all the problems away and all the stressors. Mm -hmm. So yes, I think that that is, that is huge because I feel like there's, there's mom shame. There's mom guilt that goes on out there for a variety of reasons. Again, for a working mom, for a mom struggling with any substance for a mom I, we can, we don't even need to go into all the reasons why moms can feel mom guilt. We all know it for a reason. We're not doing good enough uh, cooking. We're not grocery shopping healthy enough. Our house isn't clean enough, whatever. I mean, like I said, the list can go on. So there's enough mom guilt out there. But I think oftentimes in Christian circles, there's a double down. It's like a double dose for you, Missy. It's like a double dose of shame because, oh, you're a Christian mom. You should trust God more. You should pray harder. You should let go and let God. You should be some more surrendered. Well, hello. I know that. And I'm, I'm trying. In fact, the more you, you alluded to it earlier, the harder I tried through my own willpower and mm -hmm. white knuckling approach and just pull it together, get it together mm -hmm. or don't let them see. Don't let them see that part of you. It made everything worse, made everything harder for me than when I just came out and said, yeah, that's, I'm out of balance over there in my life. Doesn't mean, doesn't mean I need a label because I'm not going to stay stuck there. But right now that's where I am. I'm, I was struggling because I wasn't living a congruent aligned life. And that alone, the mental tug of war alone was enough to cause me this double mindedness. And, you know, the Bible talks a lot about that, about how exhausting it is and how ineffective it is. And that's what I noticed in my own life. I felt like I was just chasing my own tail. It's like groundhog day. <laughs> and it was not, if I was not being effective in my own life to, to do what I wanted to do and reach my goals because I was just managing uh, problems, not going through them like mm -hmm. I wanted to. Mm -hmm. and, and that can become really dangerous, you know, so when we're, we're, we're looking at everybody else and who we think um, has it together. And then we start envying them and think, well, you know, if I could just be like this person or, you know, why can't I get my stuff together? Because they're all together. But the, the truth is, is that we all go through things. And, and I share this quite often. The Bible tells us that we're going to go through trials um, and we, we don't have, just because we're Christians, we're not absence of pain or absent of pain and, and circumstances and trials and things like that. And so when we look at somebody else and we say, oh, well, they have everything together. Well, that's probably not true. There's something going on. Like you just mentioned, I love this. My house is not clean. So, um, <laughs> often as, as a mom myself of several little kids. And, uh, you know, I struggle with, well, what do I tell people? What do I don't, you know, as far as, oh, well, do I work? Do I, I teach my school? Um, I'm sorry, my kids homeschool. We've just entered homeschool this year, like everybody else. Um, right. you know, do I, do I focus more on, on teaching them school all day or do I stop at some point and I actually get some work done or do I clean the house? I mean, <laughs> it's just like right. they do all the things and we're supposed to do all the things. And we look at um, everybody else over social media and we think they all are doing all the things, but if you constantly try to keep up with that, it, it's just exhausting. And it's so dangerous because a you're, you're putting so much pressure on everybody else to keep up with all the things, but you're putting that pressure on yourself, you know, to, to keep up with everybody else. And it's okay. If, you know, somebody does 500 things and you only do 200 that day, or if you only do one that day, you know, <laughs> I'm like, okay, kids are safe. We're good. I mean, it was a good day, yeah, right? We're, we're alive. We're breathing with okay. powers on water's Everybody, running. Yes. <laughs> Everybody's waking up today. We're, we're good. Thank you, God. Right. Well, <laughs> and you bring up such a great point because I think when we spend so much time posturing ourselves out there, we're really depleted. And then when a crisis comes, when a tragedy happens, when a difficult, a real difficulty arises, we've spent so much time creating this life that is not really even true or, or maintainable. It's not sustainable. 
that that's when I I see, and, and even in my own life, that's when things start to really kind of get out of control and out when they're already kind of not in reality. I think living in the present, being sober minded, living in the present can actually give you the resilience you need because that's hard enough. I'm telling you, you know it yourself, living present in your own messy, difficult, glorious, fun, challenge, all of it, the highs and the lows, but living in that reality actually sets you up better to handle difficulty than posturing, acting like that's not really your life. That's what I've seen. When you mentioned earlier, have I seen women turn to alcohol? Like something snaps, something happens. And absolutely. um, Whether that's, you know, a life stage transition, like becoming an empty nester, that's a big trigger for people. A lot of moving people, when people move, they don't have the social Mm -hmm. structure. So they grieve really the loss of their social network. They get in a new place and they don't have that. And so often people turn to drinking as just a a boredom reliever, stress reliever. Um, and, And then, you know, heaven forbid, when and if a serious crisis comes, that is definitely, if people haven't really been honing in on some of these coping skills that are so tested and tried under major tragedy, even for the best, it's already difficult enough. I find that, uh, yes, alcohol definitely is like pouring gas on the flame, mm-hmm. you know, it of anxiety, depression, sadness, which are all the things that often when people are grieving, that's why they turn to alcohol to get reprieve from the sadness, from the depression, from the anxiety. And it's really frustrating because it actually makes all of those things worse, chemically speaking and emotionally, mentally, everything. It's such a, it's such a robber really steals that resilience. And so I'm curious too, along your travels, if you've seen that where people you you've dealt, I know with people that have had serious loss and, yeah. and what you've seen, maybe they weren't someone that struggled before and that loss really kind of flipped the switch for them. Right. Um, well, before I, before I talk about that real quick, I wanted to go back to something that you said, uh, you know, you said we, you know, we can't sustain the things that, that we're trying to do and, um, we should live in the present. And, and that I think is so important because a, it, you know, in grief, you have to really go through those emotions. So that is that present. That's not living in the past. It's not, Oh, well, I'll put it to the side and go, you know, deal with it tomorrow kind of thing. It's deal with it right now. But, um, you know, when my daughter Isabella, she was very sick. And so we had, um, you know, a lot of hospital stays and, and we had, um, five and a half months in the NICU. And I remember one uh, meeting we had with her physicians and I don't, I don't know where it came from, but I said, you know what, we're just going to do it like stair steps. We're going to take it one step at a time. And that is something that I continue with, um, with the grief symposiums that we do. And when talking to other people is we say, Hey, you know what, it's, it's one step forward and two steps back sometimes, but we're constantly trying to move. We're just constantly trying to step forward. It's not moving on. It's moving forward, trying to, um, walk towards this place of hope from whatever it is that, uh, has happened, you know, that has, has got us paralyzed in, in our fear and our doubt and our sadness and our anxiety, all of those things. And, uh, as far as seeing, you know, people turning to, uh, alcohol or substances and things like that. Yes. So, um, over the years I have seen people have the, um, unfortunate, um, choices that, that they have made to turn to substances to feel like that they were going to take that edge off to feel like that they are able to even live in this world because so many people don't even want to live because of them, some of the things that have happened. And in, um, in fact, I was just reading a post on social media the other day and somebody said something about, well, what do you do when alcohol quits working? And, you know, I just put one word in there and I said, pray, 
you know, and, and so for me, that was, that was my answer. You know, what do I do when I have grief? I pray. Um, when I feel like I can't cope, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. And sometimes that prayer is not anything, but you know, God, I can't God help me, you know, and in the, in the past it was God, I miss her. You know, that's all I can say. And, and God knows our hearts. Um, but, you know, you know, there was a, a huge thread of people posting under that, talking about how they, you know, went to alcohol so that they could find that relief. They even other substances, you know, that they used to just kind of knock them out of reality a little bit because it yeah. was too difficult to deal with. And in that place, I was saying, understandable. Yeah. It really is like taking it's it's almost like suspending reality mm-hmm. for just a moment. Right. And I think hurting so bad when you're in such grief, uh, you know, we, we, you and I both get it. Even, even if I haven't grieved at the same level you have, and maybe you haven't struggled with alcohol, like I have, we do understand what it feels like to want to eject mm-hmm. out of your own life for a variety of reasons. And I, and I just, so we, we get it y'all. If you're listening to us, either, either of our audiences are going to listen to this. If you, if you're hearing us, we get it. I mean, it's so tempting and so easy to want to numb out. But like you mentioned earlier, what to do when alcohol doesn't work. That's the, that's the trap of alcohol is you literally do fall lower than where you were before you started drinking. And so it produces this need for more of itself to get the same effect. And that's what's so insidious about alcohol in particular is it builds up such a a tolerance for itself that you have to have more Mm -hmm. to get the same feeling of release or numbing out. Mm -hmm. And so that's what's so uh, scary about about it. Mm -hmm. In high level emotional times, that emotion hooks onto that feeling. And um, even from a chemical standpoint, from a brain wave neurological standpoint, when there's that much relief with that much pain, your brain locks in on that and is like green light go dopamine. And so it really attaches to that even more so than when it's a beautiful, sunny, pretty day Mm -hmm. and you're drinking on a patio. It's a different kind of drinking when you're drinking to numb, when Mm -hmm. you're drinking to medicate. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's really the, the danger. And also the understandable lure of it is it does work temporarily only to come back and bite with vengeance because now it says, now you, you kind of can't do this without me. You can't mm-hmm. even feel as good as you did when you felt bad. Mm-hmm. Now you're going to feel worse without me initially. Mm-hmm. And then that's where people really have to have that space to emotionally begin to heal and repair. So, but there's, there's it's almost like that, that time kind of coming out of the, the hole, kind of coming out of the darkness and, you know, you, I know can speak to that as you watch people really hit their rock bottom, their rock bottom of grief, mm-hmm. and then have to decide, am I going to live or am I just going to, you know, am I going to die? Am I going to shut down? Am I going to quit trying? Or am I going to choose to live and really honor maybe the person that was lost, honor myself, honor that I'm still here? And really begin to rebuild and repair. Mm -hmm. But I think that dark night of the soul, you know, that dark night where you really have to pull up and choose. No, I choose life. No, I choose good things. Mm -hmm. There's that trial period where you have to crawl up. You kind of have to get out. Mm -hmm. Definitely. It is a choice. And, you know, you really could do that with so many different things that could be addictive habits. Even, I mean, they don't have the necessarily the chemical, um, the substance, you know, that, that alcohol has, but they do change your brain and you become dependent on things. And, um, you know, even such as doing just work, workaholic, you know, focusing yeah. on that, what it does is it just pushes back. You're, um, having to deal with those emotions and the sooner that you deal with emotions and you walk through those, it's probably the better. Um, and then the other thing I want to talk about is a support system. So you are providing support for these ladies, uh, while they're with you. But I know from things that, uh, in, in, in addictions and when you deal with them, 
um, it's one thing to be in a safe place, but it's another thing to walk away from that safe place and be dumped back out into reality, into the real world where you are around the same um, people that you were prior to, to uh, getting that support, where you were around the same environment. Um, can mm-hmm. you speak to that just a little bit about the importance of that that support system? Yeah, for sure. It, it is a big deal because we live in such an alcohol centric world. We do. We're just in an uh, just an alcohol dripping society, if you will, where it's so socially acceptable. I mean, again, this is the only drug in the universe that we feel like we have to justify not taking. So it's very difficult in a world where it's so glorified and so minimized as like cute, funny, the rosé all day, all the wine memes, mommy juice, all the jokes kind of about wine o'clock. But then you're trying to make this change in your life and you've got people going, come on, it's just one or you're not that bad. Again, I work up primarily with gray area drinkers. So that's even more confusing for them, for me, when I first went back out you know, socializing as a non-drinker uh, because I had all my friends drink. My husband still drinks. Most people around me drink. So I really had to navigate how to kind of stay in my own lane and, and how to stand alone, maybe in a group physically where I was there and everyone was drinking, but knowing that I had support behind me going, Jen, you don't need it. We're here rooting for you. We're not doing it either tonight. We're It's a Friday night and we're not going to drink either. Now, everyone go go out to the party, go out to the bar, go out to the picnic, go out to whatever it is where drinking is and you can do it. So the key really is ongoing support. Um, I think oftentimes, you know, women come into sober sis, they do my 21 day reset challenge and that's awesome. But, you know, if you really want to continue growing and changing this relationship with alcohol. 21 days is is just a great start. It's a great place to kind of take a break. And then I think after that, the emotions come up that show you maybe why you were drinking. And then that's when you really need the additional support. So the way our tribe is set up is really for ongoing support. Okay, Jen, so can you give some encouragement for the um, the ladies out there? I guess that's really who we're talking to right now. It could be men as well. But, you know, if they are kind of hesitant to say that, you know, maybe they do have something going on, maybe they don't, and they want to reach out for help, but maybe their support system around them would not like uh, either support them getting help or didn't know that they drink. What would you give them encouragement uh, about Yeah. Well, I'd say, ladies, if you're out there listening, if you've got kind of that red flag in your heart, kind of that check engine light going off, picture your life like a dashboard and you see that check engine light going off. It doesn't mean you need to total your car. It just means you might need to pull off the drinking highway. Just kind of pull off and pop that hood and be able to look inside. And, um, And if you look at it like it's progress over perfection, where this is a time of curiosity. Um, And I know that that's scary to be curious about an area of your life that you almost don't want to look at because like, what would that mean? But I've got to tell you, it's so worth it. And it's never too early to look at your relationship with alcohol. You know, certainly it's never too late um, until you've got your last breath. But I think we don't have to wait for a rock bottom. You don't have to wait for something to happen that's bad. Nothing bad happened to me. I didn't get a DUI. I was never arrested. I never lost anything. Nothing bad happened to me for me to be able to change my relationship with drinking. And so you have permission to do that at any point in time. It's not the question, is life bad enough? But the question really is, is life good enough? Is this working for me? And then be thinking, you know, it's not if it's when challenges in life come, are you going to be ready? Well, one way you can build your resilience is practice, practice in reality, practice in a normal challenging day. So you don't have to be afraid of difficulties that come your way because you're practicing living life in the now. And that has plenty of practice for handling difficult things can help. Awesome advice. Um, so where can everybody find you? We said sober sis. Can you give them all the places to find you, Jen? Yeah, sure. I am on Instagram. I'm I'm on there. If you're on Instagram, find me at sober sis. 
And then I also have a free guide that I love to offer women. So if you're just like, Jen, I don't know about your 21 day reset, but I just want to, I just want help for tonight, or I just want to kind of get five tips and tricks from you to help me this weekend. Um, you can go to services.com and download my free guide. And that free guide is literally the top tools in my sober minded toolbox. So if you just want to take a night off, tap the brakes or just get to know me a little bit better, that's a great place to start. And then at the beginning of every month, I start a new 21 day reset challenge. And that's where the connection really comes from. And I recommend it to anyone, anyone who's drinking that wants to be able to look closer at their relationship with alcohol. Awesome. Awesome. So thank you so much, Jen, for being on Faith Breathed Hope. Uh, for the rest of you, continue to be blessed and bless others. And we'll see you next time. And I want to thank you for joining us on Faith Breathed Hope, where you gain inspiration and motivation to renew hope and discover purpose in any circumstance. Please like and share this podcast and give us a review on iTunes. Be blessed.